So, Eric. Believe me, I had no choice. Brother! So, we just took in episode two of House of the Dragon, and there was a lot that happened. But the most significant scene were the deaths of Sir Eric and Sir Arik Cargill. In fact, this might be the most significant scene this season, which is probably a pretty hefty claim. But hold on tight, because I'm about to delve into George R. R. Martin's machinations and show you how this scene, this fan correspondence, and this interview... But then one day, suddenly, this chapter came to me almost... ...can inform us about the original sin that caused the first long night, and what George R. R. Martin has planned for the ending of his main book series. And spoilers, it's not about King Bran, and it's never been about King Bran. But in order to do this, we need to learn about Kinslaying and delve into George R. R. Martin's most ancient lore. And with that out of the way, let's get started. As you may already be aware, Kinslaying is a great taboo in Westeros. Any individual who kills a member of their own family is dubbed a Kinslayer and believed to be cursed forever in the eyes of the gods and men. And the saying, no man is so accursed as the Kinslayer, is a mantra repeated consistently throughout the book series, and this sentiment is highlighted when Rob beheads Rickard Karstark. We are kin, Stark, and Karstark. That didn't stop you from betraying me, and it won't save you now. I don't know what it to say. I wanted to hold you to the end of your days. Kill me and be cursed! And also echoed in the season two House of the Dragon teaser trailer as well. There is no war so hateful to the gods. There's a war between kin. But this saying in the book series is a deeply seated belief, no matter your religion or where you're from. But if you look at Martin's most ancient lore, you will find that it's quite possible this saying might have an ancient historical significance that has somehow been lost through time. But to understand this, we have to start with the deaths of the Cargill brothers, because they hold the key, or rather, their inspiration does. In a 2001 correspondence letter posted on Westeros.org, a fan had inquired where his inspiration for the Cargill brothers came from. George R. R. Martin answered that Sir Eric and Sir Arik were inspired by the twin knights, Sir Balin and Sir Balin, of Arthurian legend, who appear in Mallory. For those unfamiliar with the story of Sir Balin and Balan, they are two brothers who unknowingly engage in combat and kill each other. But this inspiration goes deeper than that, much deeper. Just as Sir Eric and Sir Arik were inspired by Sirs Balin and Balan, we have Balin Greyjoy, who was killed by his brother. Baylor Breakspear was also killed by his brother, and King Baylor the Blessed was rumored to have been killed by his uncle. Then there is the tale of Bale the Bard, who was killed by his son, and serves as a cautionary tale about Kinslaying. And it has been foreshadowed that Balin Swan, who is currently in Tommen's King's Guard in the books, will soon be fighting his brother Donal. And in the books, the sigil George R. R. Martin gave House Swan are two swans that appear to be fighting. And given the naming pattern that we have just discussed, it will likely be Sir Balin who falls when their swords meet. So George R. R. Martin has done a lot to include this as a hidden recurring motif, but why? Like I said, it goes back to the long night, and while the TV show gave us a small amount of information regarding what had occurred, we were being slaughtered, our sacred trees cut down, we needed to defend ourselves. Little other information was provided regarding the people involved or what was happening, unless you do some digging into his most ancient histories and lore. You see, during the Age of Heroes, there were two legendary figures, Garth Greenhand of the Reach and the Grey King of Ironborn Legend. Garth Greenhand is often depicted as the High King of the First Men and a giver of life and fertility. He is the progenitor and father of many of the noble houses of the Reach and even noble houses outside the Reach, including House Stark through Brandon of the Bloody Blade, and House Lannister through Land the Clever, 
and even House Hightower through his daughter Maris the Maid. According to legend, Garth was said to make the land bloom, and sowed the seeds for all the world's trees. His descendants sat on a throne made from a living tree, and he was believed to have planted the intertwining weirwoods of Highgarden. However, a few of the very oldest tales of Garth Greenhand retell how Garth would die every autumn when the trees lose their leaves, only to be reborn again with the coming of the spring. But the most peculiar thing about Garth was his appearance, as he was said to have had green hands, green hair, or green skin over all. A few accounts even give him antlers like a stag. And if you weren't already aware, this depiction of Garth is a clear reference to the Celtic green man Cernunnos, a fertility god who is also portrayed with similar green skin, hair, and antlers. And just like Garth, the green man of Celtic mythology is linked with the cycle of the seasons with his summer and winter forms dying and being reborn as the seasons change. Two pagan holidays associated with Cernunnos are winter and summer solstice. It is during these times that winter and summer do battle. And in this seasonal struggle, summer is personified by the Oak King and winter by the Holly King. In the stories, one king defeats or kills the other. The defeated king then regenerates during the off-season, only to return to defeat the other, thus maintaining the cycle of seasons. In some stories, Oak and Holly are aspects of Cernunnos, while in others, they are separate kings, often depicted as brothers, battling endlessly as the seasons turn. And given that Garth Greenhand in Martin's world also dies in the autumn and returns in the spring, this means that he likely drew from Oak and Holly when he developed the legend. Now, just remember that Oak and Holly were said to be brothers, because this is going to be important. So, in addition to the tale of Garth Greenhand, the world book retells a very curious ancient legend in the North about a figure referred to as the First King, who is believed to have been buried in the Great Barrow in Barrowton. According to legend, the man buried in the Barrow is believed to have been the First King of the First Men, and it is said that a curse was placed on the Great Barrow that would allow no living man to rival the First King. This curse made these pretenders to the title grow corpse-like in their appearance, as it sucked away their vitality in life. So, given that this first king seems as though he has some magical control over life and vitality, like the legend of Garth, I was quite intrigued by this curse after realizing there were also legends that recount Garth as the first king of the first men. According to the world book, Garth was the high king of the first men, it is written. It was he who led them out of the east and across the land bridge to Westeros. Yet other tales would have us believe that he preceded the arrival of the first men by thousands of years, making him not only the first man in Westeros, but the only man, wandering the length and breadth of the land and treating with the giants and the children of the forest. So being that Garth was the fabled first king by many accounts, I had quickly realized it's quite possible this first king and Garth could be one and the same. However, the most intriguing thing for me was the curse itself. You see, I was reminded of this corpse-like curse each time the Grey King of the Ironborn was mentioned. In the Age of Heroes, the legends say, the Ironborn were ruled by a mighty monarch known simply as the Grey King. The Grey King ruled the sea itself and took a mermaid to wife so his sons and daughters might live above the waves or beneath them as they chose. His hair and beard and eyes were as gray as a winter sea, and from these he took his name. From there he ruled the Iron Islands for a thousand years, until his very skin had turned as gray as his hair and beard. Similar to Garth, the Grey King was also said to be godlike, However, from the description, it seems that the Ironborn were ruled by someone who is more corpse than a man, who just kept getting old. In stark contrast to Garth's green skin and hair, which is a color associated with life and fertility, the Grey King is the visual polar opposite, with gray skin, eyes, and hair, a color associated with old age and death. In fact, the Grey King and the Drowned God religion are easily identifiable with death. What is dead can never die is a mantra of the Ironborn religion itself. In stark contrast to the great feats of Garth, who was a giver of life and a planter of werewoods, the greatest feats of the Great King were literally killing trees. For example, he is said to have carved the first longship from the pale wood of a demonic tree that fed on human flesh. 
This, of course, is an obvious reference to a weirwood, given that weirwoods have pale wood and, in those times, were often given offerings of blood sacrifice. The great king was also said to have brought fire to the earth by taunting the storm god, who answered with a thunderbolt, causing a tree to burn. So what we see between Garth and the Grey King is something called an inverse parallel. They are foils of one another, opposites if you will. We see Garth was a green man and a planter of trees and werewoods, whose descendants sat on a living tree throne. On the other hand, we have the Grey King, who is a grey man, and literally killing trees in his myth. Additionally, the Ironborn culture shuns the practice of farming and considers the agrarian lifestyle Garth had taught to be disgraceful. In fact, the direct descendants of the Grey King, whom we are most familiar with, House Greyjoy, is endowed with the famous words, We do not sow. Furthermore, the Lord of the Iron Islands and the head of House Greyjoy is referred to as the Lord Reaper of Pike. The use of the word Reaper can be used to describe both death or the taking of crops where the ironborn are concerned. And during the ancient times, that is exactly what the ironborn would do, raiding up and down the coast, stealing crops and cutting down trees. And this would have been a huge violation in the eyes of the old gods, especially if the ironborn were using werewood, as the ironborn legend suggests. According to the world book, in the dawn of days, there were extensive forests on Great Wick, Harla, and Orkmont, but the shipwrights of the isles had such a voracious need for lumber that one by one the woods vanished. So the Ironborn had no choice but to turn to the vast forests of the Greenlands. And in addition to the death and reaping symbols of their culture, the house sigils of the Ironborn are a further testament to this, represented with scythes, skeletons, krakens, and even corpses, but especially scythes, which is going to be important. And, in addition to everything else, the historical records indicate that the Grey King did have a brother. So, if you start to put the pieces together, it begins to paint a picture. We have Garth, who was the first king, and associated with werewoods in life, who had died, and placed a curse upon one's vitality in life. Then we have the Grey King, a figure associated with death and cutting down werewoods, who appears to have had his vitality taken away. And when you put two and two together, you begin to see that the curse of the first king had to do with the Grey King and a Garth-type figure. The Grey King killed his brother, and Garth in turn cursed his brother's vitality. An excellent hint and allusion to this curse is in the death of Renly Baratheon. In the show, the Garth influence is muted, he wears more olive and brown tones, and wears a crown of golden antlers. But in the books, Renly wears a full green suit of armor and an antlered helm, which is meant to be highly evocative of Garth. Basically, he's walking around in the equivalent of a Garth costume. And after he is killed by his brother Stannis, the very next time we see Stannis, he is wearing gray and has experienced a gray corpse-like transformation. Stannis wore a gray wool tunic, a dark red mantle, and a plain black leather belt from which his sword and dagger hung. The red gold crown with flame-shaped points encircled his brows. The look of him was a shock. He seemed ten years older than the man Davos had left at Storm's End when he set sail for the Blackwater and the battle that would be their undoing. The king's close-cropped beard was spider-webbed with gray hairs, and he had dropped two stone or more of weight. He had never been a fleshy man, but now the bones moved beneath his skin like spears fighting to cut free. Even the crown seemed too large for his head. His eyes were blue pits lost in deep hollows, and the shape of a skull could be seen beneath his face. So yes, after Stannis kills Renly, who wears green and antlers, the very next time we see him, he is wearing gray and becomes corpse-like. It's highly evocative symbolism that is meant to be informative. So let's return to Garth's brother for a moment, because if what I'm suggesting could be true, then the Grey King was not always gray. This transformation would have been the result of the curse placed on him after killing his brother. But before this transformation, I believe there is a good chance he might have looked quite a bit like his brother, a Garth-type person, if you will. I mean, the two were related, and brothers do have a knack for looking similar, right? Knowing this, I'd like to draw your attention to the sigil of House Greyiron, the extinct house of the very first Driftwood King, and this sigil is supposed to depict the head of the Sea King. However, 
Despite the depth the World Book covered in the history and lore of the Iron Islands, we have heard nothing of this so-called Sea King, who we do learn about, however, was the Grey King, who is said to have ruled the sea itself. Now, ruling the sea itself, well, if you ruled the sea itself, then that would make you the King of the Sea. Or, said another way, the Sea King. Knowing this, I quickly realized we may have actually been provided with a mugshot of the Grey King before his Grey Transformation, and as you can tell, there are some striking similarities. But that isn't the only Ironborn House sigil with an Easter egg, as you will soon find out. Because what we're really looking at with this curse is the age-old trope of brother versus brother, basically Cain and Abel. Fascinatingly, the Cain and Abel trope appears in various versions throughout literature and folklore. In the Bible, Cain slew his brother, and in retaliation, God placed a curse upon Cain and marked him so that living became his punishment. And although Cain was once a farmer, God also cursed the ground that was soiled with his brother's blood, so that wherever Cain went, he could no longer sow the earth or draw his own harvest. So basically, Cain could no longer sow. The curse God gave him was perpetual suffering, as well as infertility of the land, which Martin pays tribute to in the Duncan Egg novella The Sworn Sword. The drought showed no signs of ending, and the small folk by the thousands had taken to the roads, looking for some place where the rain still fell. Lord Bloodraven had commanded them to return to their own lands and lords, but few obeyed. Many blamed Bloodraven and King Ares for the drought. It was a judgment from the gods, they said, for the kinslayer is accursed. Interestingly, that is just the biblical version of Cain. Still, other tales and versions exist. One tale from Celtic folklore suggests Cain was forced by God to become Anku, the hooded grim harvester of souls, which is where the inspiration for the tale of the grim reaper is derived. Yes, in some tales, Cain is the grim reaper himself. Now you know where all the death and reaping symbols are coming from. And in the books, Martin uses the name Abel as the moniker Mance Raider uses when he goes to Winterfell undercover in the guise of a bard, and Mance chooses this name as a tribute to an ancient king beyond the wall called Bale the Bard. And in Martin's world, the story of Bale the Bard is coincidentally a cautionary tale about kinslaying. Let's take a look. Thirty years later, when Bale was king beyond the wall and led the free folk south, it was young Lord Stark who met him at the frozen ford and killed him, for Bale would not harm his own son when they met sword to sword. So the son slew the father instead, said John. Aye, she said, but the gods hate kinslayers, even when they kill unknowing. When Lord Stark returned from the battle, and his mother saw Bale's head upon a spear, she threw herself from a tower in her grief. Now, remember what I was mentioning about the Oak King and the Holly King personifying summer and winter? There is also the Sumerian tale of Emesh and Enten, and many scholars have pointed to the similarities of this tale and that of Cain and Abel, and suggest that Emesh and Enten were the precursors providing the framework for the biblical version, because in this tale we see two brothers bringing an offering to their god, and the two brothers begin quarreling when one offering is preferred over the other. Think of it, in a sense, as the origin story, if you will. And what you might find thought-provoking is just like Oak and Holly, in the Sumerian tale, Emesh is the embodiment of summer, and Enten the embodiment of winter, giving us a fascinating link between Cain and Abel and the battling brothers of opposing seasons, because in their origin, Cain and Abel are indeed summer and winter. So what we have in the Grey King is by and large the embodiment of a death god, a grim reaper, if you will, that is highlighted through tons of death, infertility, and reaping symbols to drive the concept home. He is the embodiment of winter and an adversary to the fertility god Garth, who is the embodiment of life, summer, and trees. We also see a curse for kinslaying played out in the tale of Cain and Abel, with a parallel curse for kinslaying highlighted in the book series and repeated over and over by various characters. But now, if you're like me, you are probably asking yourself why. Why has the author gone to such lengths to provide such intricate and profound symbolism to this theme, and to these two historical figures in particular? 
And how does this tie into the original Long Night? Like I said, Sir Eric and Sir Arik hold the key. Or rather, the key lies within their inspiration, Sir Balon and Sir Balan. But first, we need to understand some things about the seasons and how they work in the world of Westeros. In the world Martin has created, the cycle of seasons are unpredictable and have basically been broken. In fact, a single season often lasts several years at a time, turning only by chance. For example, at the start of A Game of Thrones, the characters were living during the longest summer ever recorded. However, there is evidence to suggest these unpredictable seasons weren't always the case. According to the world book, the most ancient tales suggest the seasons had once turned in a regular pattern. And Septon Barth, a figure from history who has a knack for being right on pretty much everything, also suggests that the inconstancy of the seasons was a matter of magical art. And one maester from the Citadel published works to back this, suggesting that the seasons may have once been a regular length, determined solely by the way in which the globe faces the sun in its heavenly course. But the real confirmation came straight from the author in an interview in 2007, when he stated that the erratic nature of the seasons does have a magical explanation rather than a natural one. And this unsteady cycle of seasons was a very significant concept that was a part of the inspiration for Martin to begin writing A Game of Thrones. But then one day, suddenly, this chapter came to me, almost like preformed in my head, and it was the chapter where Bran finds the, the direwolf pups in the summer snow. Found in the summer snow. That phrase was there right from the beginning. I knew that it was the summer snows, and that put me on a line to the unsteadiness of the seasons. And there's something wrong in this world with our normal seasons. And from what we've gathered so far, we know that the seasons were once normal long ago. But if the seasons were normal at one point, we know something must have happened to cause this change. Something broke it. So the real question we should ask ourselves is what caused this change to occur? And when you think about it, the answer is pretty simple. The event that caused this is likely tied to the original Long Night, a period in history where the sun hit its face and a hard winter fell that lasted a generation. And it was then that the White Walkers came for the very first time. And knowing the significance and symbolism Martin has painstakingly injected into his series to highlight this kinslang theme of fertility and death, summer and winter, it was likely the events that led to the death of this Garth-type figure, and the transformation of the brother that played a role in this magical winter, and the erratic seasons that have followed ever since. And just as we have been talking about this grey corpse-like transformation of the Grey King, in the show we see a transformation taking place with the making of the Night King, a figure who is also associated with both death and winter. And from what we understand about Garth, Garth was aligned with trees, weirwood, nature, and likely the old gods and the children of the forest. Basically, like Bran, when Garth was alive, he was likely a greenseer. But if Garth was a greenseer, the interesting thing about them is that when they die, it is only their body that is truly dead. As Jojen tells us in A Dance with Dragons, their soul remains. The singers of the forest had no books, no ink, no parchment, no written language. Instead, they had the trees, and the werewoods above all. When they died, they went into the wood, into the leaf and limb and root, and the trees remembered all their songs and spells, their histories and prayers, everything they knew about this world. The maesters will tell you that the werewoods are sacred to the old gods. The singers believe they are the old gods. When the singers die, they become a part of that godhood. And, as you might have noticed, we do have something known as the Three-Eyed Raven. You're the Three-Eyed Raven. I've been many things. Now, I am what you see. And we learn that the Three-Eyed Raven is a title or a collection of consciousness rather than a single person, and that Bran is just the next in a long line of Three-Eyed Ravens, with each new Three-Eyed Raven assuming the knowledge of the previous. 
I became the Three-Eyed Raven. If that's true, he'll never expose himself. Yes, he will. He'll come for me. He's tried before, many times, with many Three-Eyed Ravens. But have you ever wondered where this originated, and who was the first? Well, let's think about it for a moment. We know he was probably a green seer, and connected to the old gods and the children of the forest, and his story, too, probably goes back to the first long night. That's right. The likeliest answer is that the first three-eyed raven was Garth, the Night King's brother, which explains why Bran knew the Night King would personally come after him, and also explains the long exchange between the two before the Night King's death. The reason why this was not explained or fleshed out by HBO is likely because this background story was being saved for the Long Night prequel, which was already being fleshed out and being made ready for production. Now, what you may not know is that George R. R. Martin was already in the process of writing another book when the idea for Game of Thrones came to him. The story he was writing at the time was a science fiction novel called Avalon, a title that suggests some heavy inspiration from Arthurian lore due to Avalon being a mystical island associated with Morgan Le Fay. And I started writing a science fiction novel uh, called Avalon, which was part of my uh, Thousand Worlds future history that I'd written a lot of stories about in the, in the 70s. But Avalon is also believed by some to be where King Arthur is buried, or in some versions, where he is resting as an eternal king who never truly died, but would one day return in Britain's time of need as both its once and future king. Interestingly, The Once and Future King by T.H. White is one of the five fantasy books recommended to Game of Thrones readers by George R. R. Martin in 2018, and is always a book that seems to make his recommended reading lists and was even the title of one of his Twilight Zone episodes in the 1980s. So this concept of a once and future king might have been on his mind when writing Avalon. But Martin abandoned this novel about 30 pages in, when he was suddenly inspired to write the scene with Bran finding the direwolves in the summer snows. It was the chapter where uh, Bran finds the, the direwolf pups in the summer snow. And it came to me so vividly that I knew I had to write it, so I, I put Avalon aside, I put it back in a drawer, and I... But let's just ponder on the thought that Martin was working on a novel that drew inspiration from Avalon when the idea for Game of Thrones came to him, and returned to Arthurian lore once more. Remember what I was telling you about the twins, Sir Balin and Sir Balin? Well, one of those twins is famous for more than killing his brother. He's also famous for delivering the dolorous stroke. Beyond King Arthur and the Round Table, one of the most recognizable Arthurian legends is the tale of the Fisher King. In legend, it was believed that a king's health and fertility were tied to the land. If the king was healthy and prosperous, the land would prosper as well. And in legend, the Fisher King is the last of a long line of kings tasked with guarding the Holy Grail. But after a misunderstanding, the Fisher King attacks Sir Balin, and Sir Balin unknowingly uses a spear to defend himself and a dolorous stroke is delivered, causing a wound that renders the king impotent and his kingdom to become a barren, infertile wasteland. The Fisher King legend is significant to the cycle of fertility because in this tale we see how a single sentinel event might be a catalyst causing perpetual infertility and suffering, a sort of analog to the death of Garth and the onset of the long night and never-ending winter. And the Fisher King in some tales is named King Pelham or Pelus, while in others it is Bronn. But whatever his name was, most scholars agree that an earlier figure from Celtic folklore had inspired the Fisher King, and that figure was Bran the Blessed of Celtic lore. Bran the Blessed, as you may already be aware, provided the inspiration for Bran Stark. Bran meaning raven or crow in the Celtic language. And like the Fisher King, Bran would later become wounded in his second chapter. After sustaining an injury, leaving his legs paralyzed, and in a coma, he is contacted by this three-eyed raven. And when Bran awakens from this coma dream, the first thing he does is name his wolf Summer. And as the events of the series unfold, 
Bran is compelled to the sight of the three-eyed raven, where he is fated to become the next, and in doing so, he will become one with all the three-eyed ravens who came before him, including the first, Garth. And what Martin likely has planned in the end is King Bran, and there are plenty of sources and videos and essays to support this, but what the author is likely really after in doing this is not about making Bran king, but rather, it's about returning the land to its original king, to the figure Bran is to become. It's about restoration. It's about righting the original sin, overcoming winter, and returning the seasons to their natural order. But in order to do so, the living must prevail over death, and the brothers must fight one last time, meaning that Garth will have to put his brother down for good once and for all. In the show, this is symbolized by Bran arming Arya with the blade that kills the Night King. Although, from what we know now, the Night King's death will likely play out much differently in the books. But make no mistake, Bran will need to be a part of it in some way, in order to correct this ancient wrong. And in doing so, King Bran, as the Three-Eyed Raven, will in a sense be at the same time, become both the once and future King of Westeros, and bring stability to the land once more. Well, that about wraps things up for today. If you enjoyed this video or found it useful or entertaining and want to help my channel, please be sure to leave a comment and hit that like button. It really does help. And if you're interested in more thought-provoking videos like these, be sure to subscribe and hit the notification bell. And a special thank you goes out to my channel members. Your support means so much.